We're filming for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive today in Chautauqua, New York, and I'm pleased to have Scott Robinson, saxophonist, with us. Welcome. Thank you. Just got off a pretty hot set downstairs with some good competition. Very good competition. Uh, it's a little daunting sometimes when you get some guys up there playing a whole lot of tenor. Yeah. Uh, I go through long periods of not playing any tenor because I get called to play a lot of baritone and bass clarinet and whatever. So now, suddenly, I get to play the tenor, which I love. But on the other hand, uh, it takes me a little while to get over feeling like an idiot. It's a little like By the jumping. end of the set, I didn't feel yeah. like an idiot. But, but at the beginning of the set, I really did feel like an idiot. But that's uh, it's all part of the fun. I right. I hear some. I hear some Lester Young in what you play. Is that, am I off the mark with that? No, certainly not. Lester is, uh, I think, my favorite uh, clarinet player and a uh, great composer and a great tenor player. Uh, my first 78 I ever bought was Lester Young. Uh, sometimes I'm happy in the afternoon of a bassy night on a keynote with Johnny Guarneri and Slam Stewart. And uh, I was just telling Phil Atterbury from the Mississippi Rag that uh, I met Slam Stewart in a club in Annapolis, Maryland. And I went up and I said, you know, I have this great record that you're on, and I, it has meant so much to me through the years. And he said, and he said, oh, yeah, sometimes I'm happy. Do you remember my solo on that? And he started singing it. Wow. And I knew it very well, because I listened to the record a hundred times, so we were sitting there You're in the singing. club singing this solo together. It was a great moment. Yeah. Everybody was like, what are those two doing? But I was amazed that he would just, that was, what was that, 1943 uh, uh, or something? I don't remember the year of that, but I was amazed that he could just remember his solo off mm -hmm. of that record and just say, oh yeah, I remember that. <laughs> and start singing it. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> I still can't get over that. You had a pretty good experience in high school and so forth with jazz. Well, I was a, a jazz freak, and I converted a few of my closest friends to being jazz freaks, and some of them had driver's licenses before I did, so I was able to cajole them into driving into Washington, D.C. I grew up in Virginia. Mm -hmm. And we'd go to, to Blues Alley. And at Blues Alley, I heard Earl Hines and Clark Terry and Lockjaw Davis and uh, Dizzy Gillespie, Bobby Hackett, Suit Sims, a lot of great, great musicians. And I would sit right in front with a glass of water and just take a lesson. It was great. I did that as often as I could. But it was hard because I didn't drive. Then later I got a driver's license. I was able to go in myself. But uh, those years in high school were a little tough in a way because it was frustrating. I tried to have a band. I put a little group together. And I was rehearsing it. And uh, it was hard to get. We couldn't get any work. We couldn't, couldn't get guys to rehearse. I could never get the bass player to bring his bow. I was always writing things where I wanted arco bass. And bass player never wanted to bring the bow. It was a little bit of a struggle. Uh -huh. So when I finally got to college, Berkeley College of Music in Boston, suddenly I was surrounded with people that wanted to do what I was trying to do. I had the same passion as you, perhaps? Yeah, it was like, let's rehearse. Let's play jam sessions. Let's write tunes. Let's we used to rehearse all the time. Let's get together this afternoon. Let's see how slow we can play. Let's see how fast we can play. Let's do duets. Let's do just tenor and drums. Uh, you know, trying every possible thing. It was really great, great time. So. And you went on to be uh, a faculty member there. For about a year and a half. Yeah. A part-timer. Uh -huh. Teaching saxophone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Teaching uh, ensembles and instrument repair and uh, history of tenor saxophone styles. Wow. Were the students um, 
did you try to get the students to play styles like that? It was mostly a listening No, that was a listening. That was like a lecture class. It was listening and history and uh, identifying records, identifying players and stuff mm -hmm. like that. It was hard because these people, for the most part, had never heard of Chew Berry or, or uh, they might have known. Maybe they knew Lester Young. And they probably knew the name Ben Webster, but had never heard him play, really. Tenor players, even. Mm. Wow. So it was kind of a struggle. I had to say, you know, listen for this type of sound and this way of turning the phrase around. And, and then I would quiz them by playing records, try to get them to identify the, the players. It was difficult. There were very few that really wanted to go home and listen on their own and find out what what was really going on mm -hmm. with the instrument. You know, most young music students, they just want to play as much stuff on the horn as they can. Yeah. And, you know, I don't have time to sit for hours and listen to Lester Young and Chew Berry. You know, I got to get the horn out and play all these scales and chords as fast as I can. So. Uh -huh. That's the disease. That's the music college disease, you know. <laughs> so I was happy to play my tiny role in uh, attempting to alleviate that particular affliction. I haven't qu quite put it heard like that, but I know what you're saying. That, and some people have echoed that as far as the jazz education and um, how it trains players. The fact that there's not all the opportunities to play um, that there used to be, I guess, is uh, a little hard to overcome, don't you think? Um, uh, opportunities to play, do you mean in the, in the music school situation no, or I'm, out like, of that? Out of it. Yeah. Well, what I find is there's incredible opportunities to play and in an unbelievably wide variety of contexts. You know, I do everything from the most classic jazz kind of things, with Marty Gross, Peter Eklund, for example, to Anthony Braxton, large orchestra. Uh, I play with the opera, I play with pop people, Elton John and people like that. It, in, in New York particularly, it's amazing how many different situations one finds oneself in, film scores and whatnot. But what is lacking is the chance to actually have a group and play regularly, night after night, with a group and develop a sound, develop a, a conception, a direction for your music. That's what's hard to do. It's like we get plugged in here and plugged in there, plugged into all these different situations. But it's really hard unless you uh, either struggle quite a bit or unless you're sort of a one of the new young sensations or something like that then you're able to travel with your group and yeah. play all the festivals and all that but uh, that's the element I think is missing uh, in the old days uh, groups play together night after night after night after night and that's how the music grows You've become quite a woodwind specialist and uh, do things that not that many other people do, like the bass saxophone and so forth. How'd you get into that low end of the spectrum? Well, the bass sax is a, is a passion of mine. I, I have to say it's probably my favorite of the saxophones, although I can actually do more on the tenor for now. When you say but, do more, you mean you mean play more? I think I can more. be more flexible, play in more situations. I have better range, mm -hmm. better control. But I've taken, I've taken the bass sax to where I can feel very comfortable on it in almost any situation. And I hope to take it to the level where it'll be just another tenor to me but of course an octave lower. Yeah. Uh, in answer to your question about 
getting into the bass sax. I started on alto. I started on my grandfather's alto, uh, which I still play today. It's a con that he bought in 1927. And he played with a little dance band when he was in school, along with my grandmother. She played violin. <laughs> and uh, I dearly wish I had a picture of them in that group, but none exist. Uh, then I switched to baritone because baritone was needed in the high school, or not in the high school, in the uh, junior high band. So I went from alto right to baritone. It wasn't until high school I started playing tenor. So I thought that baritone was a huge monster instrument. And then somebody told me, you know, there's one even bigger than that. It's a bass saxophone. I said, come on. They said, no, there is. And Herndon High School has one. And I didn't believe it, but I finally got my first chance to go into Herndon High School, and I saw this thing in the band room, and it was just amazing to me. So I started carrying it home and <laughs> borrowing it and playing on it. Yeah. The band director was very nice. He let me take it home. I walked back and forth to school, and I was a little gangly little kid, you know, carrying this incredibly heavy Basics. thing in a, in a wooden case, carrying it through these fields, which are now all built up, unfortunately, but I remember the, the handle was, was on the sloping part of the case, and it, and it was a hard, kind of a sharp-edged handle, and it was on the slope, so all the weight would pull down right into this part of my hand like this, and it was agony. But man, when I got that thing home, I sure had a ball with You that. were paying some dues just getting it home. Oh, but <laughs> boy, I said, this is really something. And I dreamed of someday having one. And I, I finally did get one. It's a long story, but there was one at another high school that was completely banged up and unplayable. And, and I had seen it there once. And so after I got to college, I got thinking about it. I said, I want that horn. I started calling down there and asking about it. And they said, oh, it belongs to the school, and we can't part with it and all that. But to, just to shorten the story, after 12 years, <laughs> The guy retired, and a new band director came in. And he says, we, we can't use this thing. We're going to put it on an on a obsolete list, and then we can get rid of it. So I went down there and made a special trip down there to see it. And we got it out, and it was all old, and a couple parts were missing, you know. And he says, oh, gee, I didn't realize it was that bad. He says, well, if you donate 50 bucks to the band department, we'll give you the horn. So I got this horn and uh -huh. I restored it. I made the keys for it and everything. No kidding. You made it yourself? Wow. Yeah. But I knew I was going to get one someday. I had already written a piece for it called Rapture of the Deep. And uh, sometimes that seems to be a good way to get some instrument I need. If I write music for it, <laughs> then it sets up some kind of gravitational <laughs> field. And eventually, I think it'll come to me. Wow. And um, you've been using that on some of the classic jazz, as we see in that uh, recent Jazz Times picture, yeah. which is really nice, which we'll probably insert in this video. Uh -huh. um, tell me about that particular concert, and um, what is the function of the bass saxophone in that, in that classic jazz? Well, that's... That's where the instrument has seen its primary use. Um, of course, Adrian Rollini is the acknowledged master of the bass saxophone, playing in the 20s on all those great records with Big Spider Beck. And uh, so that represents sort of the standard by which that type of use of the instrument is measured. Mm -hmm. And so Randy Sankey does a lot of Bix music and tr trumbo and all that. And I, he knows I play the C melody too, so I get to sort of be the trumbo Rollini uh, amalgam yeah. in those concerts. And it's a lot of fun. But I like to also use the bass saxophone in other situations where it doesn't normally get used. Um, it's a great instrument for ballads. 
I think it's the ideal instrument. No kidding. Balance. Can you see bringing one of those to these these kind of festivals someday? Yeah, I brought one to the uh, Indicator, the jazz party there. I, uh -huh. I brought it, and uh, but it is hard to travel with. I could have brought it here if if I didn't need the baritone, but they said they wanted the baritone, so I couldn't really bring both of them. Yeah. Otherwise, if I had a choice, I probably would bring the bass sax. It's great. You know, people are really amazed when you get up with a rhythm section and play really beautiful um, Stardust or something uh -huh. like that on it. Everybody's like, wow. You know, because <laughs> they've never heard that instrument used that way. Cool. It's a great melodic instrument. Uh -huh. It's great for bebop stuff, too, and playing fast. Uh -huh. I got to hear this. Yeah. Do they even make them anymore? Uh, in Europe. Yeah. Nobody makes them in America, but in Europe you can you can get one. I don't know how good they are. Mm. And of course, you're not stopping there either. You're, you're going down <laughs> another fifth. <laughs> I never stop anywhere. I I don't acknowledge boundaries of any type. So well, you have an album coming out with a contrabass. Yeah. Yeah. I never that instrument. I never even dreamed of of getting, but because there's so few in the world, there's like a dozen in the world. But I just happened to meet somebody in Rome. I told him I was looking for old instruments. And he says, oh, there's this giant saxophone in an <laughs> antique shop. And I really didn't believe him because people say, oh, yeah, you know, it's like, it's like higher than that door. And then you go look at it, it's a baritone or something. Uh -huh. That kind of thing happens all the time. Yeah. But this guy was for real. His name's Enrico. And he was for real with this, and he sent me pictures of it. And I was out of my mind, you know, I couldn't sleep. I, I just... <laughs> but there again, the guy didn't want to sell it. He had it just standing up in this antique furniture shop, and he had canes and umbrellas and stuff in, down inside it. <laughs> and that took two and a half years, so that was blink of an eye compared with the bass size. Huh. And finally, the guy parted with it, and my friend brought it over in a big box the size of a phone booth. <laughs> I picked him up at the airport, and we brought this thing home, and it's just unbelievable. And the, the amazing thing is how small the bass sax looks uh -huh. next to this. The bass saxophone just... I busted out laughing, you know. We dragged them both out in the yard, and we stood them up, and it just... The contrabass is... And then the bass sax is just down here. It's amazing. So this is an active below a baritone sax? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But it seems proportionately larger somehow than what you would, what you would think. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's at least twice the size of the bass sax. It's amazing. It's taller than me. I'm 6'4", or, or nearly. What did they use it for? Well, I would love to know, really. Yeah. It has a it has one of these on it, which is a a little uh, mount oh. for a marching lyre. <laughs> oh, they put wheels on it. And I love that. I like to tell, I show it to people. I said, you know, I wouldn't have bought it without that. But it has, yeah. you know, it's, it's set up for marching, so I said, okay, I'll get it. So I mean, maybe it was used in parades. Could have been a tuba, you know. It might have been used in parades. Oh. So what's the context of the record you're going to record? Did you use a, a rhythm section, or...? You mean the record the, that's coming out? With the contrabass, yeah. Yeah, that's already been recorded. That's coming out next week, mm -hmm. I think. Um, it's a rhythm section. There's a couple extra horns on some of the tracks. Dan Barrett's on it. My brother David plays cornet and trumpet on maybe half of it. And the contrabass is on two, two cuts, and then the rest is, is mm -hmm. on the bass sax. There's some sarusophone and uh, tenor C melody and so on. Some bass clarinet. I didn't play any brass on this record. Sometimes, <laughs> but I, you do play brass too. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Well, that's interesting. I suppose, in some sense, it's it's good to specialize in those kind of things because you have less competition. How many guys around that play bass sax, you know? And wasn't there a bass saxophone on a Paul Simon record, um, Graceland? 
I remember really? seeing someone playing a bass sax just on that one tune. I don't know. I don't know and, too much and about And I recognize the name, too. Right. There's a guy, one guy, other guy who does it occasionally. Can't think of it at the moment. Well, it's certainly possible. My brother is working on a discography of the bass saxophone. He's been doing it for years, and he's dug up a lot of incredibly obscure items. Hmm. And there's some classical things, and there's some shows and movie music and different things that you wouldn't necessarily know about. There's a lot of stuff out there besides the, the Adrian Rolini and Spencer uh -huh. Clark stuff. So he's interesting. He's You've done some uh, some writing too. Is that correct? Yeah. On the new record, I chose not to do any composing. I just wanted to arrange. Mm -hmm. So I did arrangements of a lot of Duke things and just some different, yeah. some kind of obscure tunes. But uh, yeah, I, I like to write. I like to compose. Uh, Frank West asked me to do some writing for for him. He, he started an octet with two saxophones, just him and myself, and two trumpets and a trombone. It's a really nice little band. So I was very honored to be asked mm. by such a great writer to write and by such a great saxophone player yes. to be the other saxophone in his band. I was thrilled with that. So we do, we have two records out on Concord and uh, he just came up to me the other day and said he wants to start, do some rehearsals, do some more music. So he wants me to write some more stuff. Cool. What about, uh, you've also done some writing for publications? Oh, not too much. I did, uh, I did an article for Saxophone Journal uh -huh. about the bass sax. Yeah. Um, and I was just asked to write liner notes, so that'll be a first. I mean, I wrote my own liner notes once before, but this is for uh, Storyville Records, a record by Klaus Silensari, great uh, Finnish drummer. So. Uh, um, you know, I enjoy a little, little bit of writing. I'm not like my father. He's a real writer. He's re just retired from National Geographic. Oh. And he can really write. Uh -huh. uh, for me, it's kind of a laborious process, but it's fun. Did your parents think you were a little weird to be hauling this bass saxophone home, by the way? They probably thought I was a little weird. I, I don't know if that would have been the reason. But uh, <laughs> no, I think they... They uh, both appreciate music, and they both uh, got a kick out of that. And, yeah. and uh, you know, my father, it's, it's his father's saxophone that I'm playing. And my brother played my dad's cornet. And now I have my mother's piano mm -hmm. that she left to me. So it all ties in there. So yeah. no, I, we were not subject to any of that. Uh, you know, you're not going to play mm. the devil's music or any of that kind uh -huh. of stuff. Right. Like you hear a lot of those stories. Yeah. I, fortunately, I didn't have to contend with anything like that. It's always been a very supportive atmosphere. Now, some of the music I've played through the years has certainly raised some eyebrows. And I think there was a period when my parents were a little concerned about <laughs> whether I was going to really go out in the world and play some of this music. I think those concerns have been put to rest. They, they, you know, my dad has seen that I'm out here surviving, and he's seen me on the Letterman show and CNN and stuff. So I think he's, he knows I'm all right. <laughs> so you're legitimate. Now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about your visit to uh, the Black Caucus Jazz Forum. Oh, that was when was that? That was. Uh, must have been like eight years ago or something. That's Congressman John Conyers mm -hmm. holds that every year. Uh, Congressional Black Caucus, they meet and discuss jazz-related issues. This is where the, the resolution to declare jazz a national treasure, this is how that uh, was engendered through these meetings and these discussions. Yeah. But they called me up and said, uh, well, we're having a panel about jazz in the family. And uh, we want you to come and speak. So 
I don't really come from a jazz family, but maybe they knew about my brother. They, they didn't have him on the list, so I called him up and they, I said, uh, or I told them they should call him up, and it, so both of us were there. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the Marsalis brothers was there. I think it was Branford. Branford was there, and we were chums from college oh, anyway. at Berkeley together? Yeah. And also Thelonious Monk Jr. was there. Now I've started doing some playing with him. In fact, I played the bass sax uh, with his little, uh, what is it, a tentet, I think, they have playing the music of Monk. So uh, and we just we just went around and did, talked a little bit about how we got involved in jazz and all that. And of course, it, in most cases, it does come through the family somehow. You know, our father had old 78s. How many times have you heard that story? Mm -hmm. uh, we listened to Dad's 78s, and we got all excited about music. And there you go. He had Firehouse Five and Louis Armstrong and various things. So that's what got, got my brother and I all fired up uh -huh. about hot music. Yeah, hot music. What? Do you have a, a an opinion on the oh, the racial state of jazz these days? I, I think of it when I'm in a, a function like this, that um, that the audience is all white. Yeah. And and the bands are except all except for the exception of one player at this particular yeah. festival, and it seems to be the the case. The only yeah. difference I've seen was a actually a jazz cruise that I went on once, and um, I don't know, do you have a, any indication of why that's happened? Oh boy, that's a very complicated issue. I think it has something to do with the stratification of this music. You know, it gets it's like an Oreo cookie that people are always trying to take apart and just get at one layer of it somehow. Mm. Um, you know, there's, the, there's so many different factions and different camps. And, uh, well, it's got to be classic jazz, you know. And, well, how do we find that, define that? Well, it's got to be this or that. It's got to be like, uh, um, you know, Chicago school, it's, or it's got to be the Oliver uh, Armstrong Harden uh, thing, or the or the uh, the Austin ha High Gang. It, you know, there's so many different, or it's got to be the Condon thing, and uh, and then you've got the bebop faction, and then and the the uh, you know what they call the avant-garde, and, and all of this. It's all so stratified. And everybody's trying to pick out a certain layer of it and sweep all the others aside. And I think that must have something to do with it. Because at these kind of events, the entire spectrum of the music is not really presented, of course. It's, it's a quote unquote mainstream, you know, tra traditional slash mainstream. Uh, segment of the music. Mm -hmm. And I think that maybe the black audiences are not attracted to that. The black audiences are certainly there. I mean, I played uh, at the Jackie Robinson Foundation afternoon for jazz, which is held annually. And that was one of the best times I ever had at a festival. I did it this year also, but I did it two years ago. This year was with Thelonious Monk Jr. and two years ago was with Frank West's band, with Frank Foster as a guest soloist. And I don't know how many people are there, but it's just a huge sea of people, almost all black people. And they are very, very enthusiastic and very, very happy to hear this music, and they come up and they say, thank you, 
thank you for coming here and playing this music for us. This is, we, we hunger for this. This is just great. And many of the performers are black. Oh, they treated us so nicely. They had all oh, this great food, collard greens and yams and all of that, you know? And they're like, oh, can we carry your instruments? Can we, you know, it, it was, uh, we were fantastically well treated. And, and I remember leaving there and this woman came up and said, please come back, please. You come back here and play for us again. And I had just come from an event uh, more of this genre. I felt like everybody was kind of apathetic and <laughs> nobody was, I'm not talking about this event. Yeah, I know what you mean. I'll leave the event unnamed. Right. But everything was white, all the musicians were white, all the audience was white, the music um, clung to a relatively narrow band of the spectrum of jazz possibilities. It was very safe. And I felt like, okay, now there's a lesson to be learned here somewhere, <laughs> you know. Is it possible that we could make these kind of events more inclusive and present a little wider spectrum of the music and bring more people into it and maybe people from this kind of camp would discover that, hey, this stuff's pretty good and people from that kind of camp would sort of, hey, you know. I would like to have things I always like to have things mixed up a little bit. Mm -hmm. A little of this, then a little of that. And then uh, I'm not afraid of being shocked or of shocking people. So, I don't know, I think it might be possible to present um, a little wider spectrum and, and have a more balanced uh, audience. It's a little scary, I think, for the future of some of this music when you look at the audience and the I doubt there's many people at this festival that are under 55, you know, and you wonder, are, are there going to be younger listeners that at least come into this particular style yeah. of music? Right. Well, I there mean, again, at the Jackie Robinson Festival, there were all ages there. Yeah. And there were families and with their little kids, and uh, there were young um, amateur players, and there mm -hmm. was all it was a wider segment, so, you know, we need to bring those people in. Mm -hmm. If we could bring, I mean, that would be great if we could bring those people in. Of course, something like this, uh, I don't know, I, I'm not the uh, type <laughs> to be able to put something like this together, but, yeah. Um, I think it ought to be possible somehow to, to bring in families and mm -hmm. younger people. Because it happens in these other kind of situations. Mm -hmm. Well, you've certainly played in an awful lot of uh, big band situations. Do you like big band, uh, you know, Illinois, Jaquette, and those kind of things? Yeah, I enjoy every kind of playing, so um, I don't have any particular love of big band, as lo a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. And uh, nor do I despise it, but playing with a great band. I mean, you mentioned Illinois Jacquette, and when, at the time I was in the band, that was a really great band and wonderful learning experience. And also Mel Lewis, playing with Mel Lewis' band and touring with him, that was a great experience too. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm always thrilled and delighted to play with a great band, playing great music. Uh -huh. Thad Jones' music is indescribably amazing. Yeah. So that'll never get old. I'll play that stuff anytime. Are you um, your own business agent? Do you have an agent that sends you work? Or are you pretty much... No, I, I function as my <laughs> business agent, uh, booking agent. Um, PR person, uh, shipping clerk, <laughs> uh, roadie, everything else, and I'm uh, not good at most of those functions. A lot of musicians have trouble with the areas that need to be taken care of outside their playing. It's, yeah. it's hard. Well, there's few of us that 
uh, anybody like that is is interested in mm -hmm. really. So you know nobody's interested in booking Scott Robinson or producing you know anything I'm I'm going to do other than answering the phone and going to play with this orchestra that band anything beyond that is uh, either I'm going to do it or it's not going to happen. Yeah. So most of the time it doesn't happen. But every once in a while. I, I went through a phase in the 80s of really getting on the phone and booking myself in Europe and stuff like that. And then I, I had some scary experiences and, and I got a little bit frightened away from that. And now I'm trying to gingerly sort of get, get back to the st stage of trying to uh, not just be a sideman for the rest of my life, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think I'm starting to come out of my shell a little bit. Maybe the giant saxophone is, is going to help me with that. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like an album title, doesn't it? Yeah. Scott and his giant saxophone. Sounds like a kid's book. Scott and his giant <coughs> saxophone. Well, I used the title Thinking Big for the record, but the other title I was thinking of was The Big Picture. Uh-huh. I don't know, which do you prefer? <coughs> I like thinking big, yeah. actually. The big picture looks too much like some corporate uh, thing, you know, looking down the road, what's our product going to be in, you know, 20 years? Oh, I would think of it like that. <laughs> I would think of it like, you know, the universe. <laughs> That's how I would think of it, and, and of course, the, the saxophone. Yeah. Tell me about this particular horn. This is a con made in 1924. I call it the flop ears because it's got the bell keys on opposite sides, uh -huh. like Dumbo the elephant. Yeah. You get the flop ears in there, <laughs> All right? It's a good old horn. It's raggedy. It's old. It's worn out. It leaks. It's got soul, though. <laughs> it's got some soul to it. Yeah. I got it in an antique store for seventy-seven dollars and fifty cents. Mm -hmm. It was in Maryland, and I was a kid in school, and I saw the horn there, and I thought, "Gosh, you know, that's the same as my grandfather's alto. It's like a matching horn, but seventy-seven dollars." You know, I thought, "Gee." So I went home, and then I started agonizing about it. So I called up the store finally. I said, "Do you still have that tenor saxophone?" They said, "Oh, that was stolen." I said, really? It was stolen? And they said, yeah. We don't have it. But they caught the guy who, who was stealing stuff. And I said, really? And they said, yeah, we might get it back. So this started a long process. For months this went on, and I kept calling them, and, uh, and now I'm out of my mind. And I should have bought that tenor. I should have bought the tenor. <laughs> and finally they said, okay, we got the horn back. But we're supposed to hold it as evidence. <laughs> We're not supposed to sell it until this whole case has been resolved. And, and this thing dragged on and on. And finally, I called them once again, and they said, all right, you know what? Just come up here and get the horn. And so I drove up, and I bought the horn. Boy, was I happy. Boy, every instrument you have seems to have a story behind it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because I root around in antique shops and yeah. junk stores and flea markets, and I'm always all, my hands are all dusty and dirty and going through piles of stuff. Uh -huh. And uh, you come across a lot of great things that way, and, yeah. it, and it's a lot of fun. How many instruments do you own? Oh, a couple hundred, probably. No kidding. Yeah. Yeah, a lot, a lot. I have a whole big, yeah, it's, it's, it's a sickness. <laughs> visit me, if you're in West New York, New Jersey, come over and visit me and you just, yeah. you won't believe it. Okay. You won't believe what you see. I can't believe it. And I live there. <laughs> All right, well, I know that you've got to report downstairs and see what their schedule's like. Yeah, I'm guessing we're still pretty far behind. Yeah. Um, what do you think about advice to a 17-year-old aspiring jazz musician these days? Listen. That's my advice. 
is a lesson, and everything else grows out of that. You know, if you if you li if you listen to great music, you'll get excited about it. You'll get ideas. You'll start wanting to transcribe. You'll start wanting to learn those tunes. You'll start trying to figure out how do they get that kind of sound out of the horn? How does that sound? It's like a you know, and you start fooling around. You start thinking, well, maybe I could write something, or maybe I could start a group. And so you start writing and compose. So everything comes out of listening. Mm -hmm. That's how it starts. We hear music, I mean, and you go, wow, is it possible that, that maybe I could actually do that someday? Is that possible? And you start trying to find out. And I'm still trying to find mm -hmm. out. <laughs> Well, I think you're searching pretty well, and uh, yeah. wish you the best of luck with your new recordings with Frank West, which I'm sure is a real gas, and uh, everything else that you managed to do. Well, thanks for sharing your time on behalf thanks, of Mark. Hamilton College. All right. All right. Thank you.